Welcome to Altium Academy, everybody. I'm your host, Zach Peterson, and today we are going to be looking at a viewer question about series and parallel termination methods and how to route them. Now, of course, whenever you start talking about high-speed design, you'll start seeing guidelines saying that you should apply manual termination, whether it's series, parallel, or some other method. Should you actually do this, or do you need to do this? Well, it all depends. We're gonna dig into that in this video. Let's get started. So before we get started, let's take a look at that viewer question. M. Gorbani writes, very useful info. Please make more videos on series and parallel termination resistor reasons and how to route them. For example, using series termination on EXT SD RAM clock or parallel termination on diff pair clock cases. Can using termination help? How much length matching will be fine for EXT SD RAM signals? So obviously there's a lot of stuff going on in that question and I've done my best to answer some of those points in a reply to that comment on the SPI versus I squared C video. What I want to focus on is the first part of that question, which is the use of series and parallel termination resistors. When do you need to use them and how you should use them? So let's take a look at how to do this correctly. So before addressing how to use series and parallel termination resistors, I want to look at when you should use series and parallel termination resistors. And the first place to start is not to start looking at stuff like the critical length rule or things like this. It's really to start looking at the type of interface. We have digital interfaces that can have an impedance spec. So when an interface has an impedance spec, what it means is that the output impedance is intended to be matched to the input impedance, and that is intended to be matched to the trace impedance. But here's the thing. On impedance-specified interfaces, Z out and Z in are defined on the semiconductor die. So you can have what is called on-die termination. And in the case where you have on-die termination, you generally have a case where your Z in and your Z out are terminated to target a specific impedance, usually 50 ohms single-ended or 100 ohms differential, depending on the type of interface that you're working with, or for other interfaces, you could have different values for the target impedance. So the point here is that when you see a 50 ohm impedance spec for a component in a data sheet, or for example, if you see a 50 ohm target impedance for the PCB trace, typically there will already be termination that exists on the semiconductor die. So in that case, you don't need to apply series or parallel termination at all. So this is gonna be the case in components that are targeting certain specifications like USB, ethernet, CSI or DSI for the MIPI standards folks out there, LVDS, PCIe, DDR, and the list goes on and on. So there are a lot of different specifications out there for these interfaces where they already have the impedance built into it. And you should expect that the impedance is already built into it. Even if you're working with something like an FPGA, where you have the freedom to instantiate the interface in certain logic blocks in that FPGA. So in these cases, the termination circuit is already built into the semiconductor die, and you shouldn't need to apply any external signals. Of course, just make sure you check the application circuit in the data sheet. They may recommend some external components or like some external series resistors, such as, for example, DC coupling. So one example where you may have DC coupling is with LVDS, and that might involve two 50 ohm series resistors placed on the transmission lines between the driver and the receiver. So in this case, where your interface has an impedance specification, don't start getting clever and using a critical length rule to try and size the trace so that it has a different impedance from these impedance values. Just use an online calculator to get a really good estimate of the trace impedance and then size the impedance to that value. Just use a calculator to figure out the width that you need for that trace in order to hit the target impedance. And it's pretty simple. There's lots of free calculators online. And of course, if you use Altium Designer, there's a built-in impedance calculator that's very accurate. The other type of interface that might need termination but doesn't have an impedance spec is something like SPI or your GPIOs. So on SPI, and on GPIOs, and even on something slower like I squared C, 
you don't have any kind of impedance specification. And so I think this is the case where somebody looks at this and says, hey, when do I need to apply a series termination resistor or a parallel termination resistor, and when can I get away with not doing it? So let's take a look at the case of SPI and GPIOs. And the reason I want to ignore I squared C is because in I squared C, you typically have the rise time being so slow that the board has to be extremely large in order for you to reach any kind of case where you're gonna actually need termination. So for most cases that you're going to encounter in practice, you can basically ignore that. But for SPI and GPIOs, the rise time, if you look at a digital signal that's being output from this interface, that rise time is going to be somewhere on the order of maybe five or 10 nanoseconds. And if you're actually driving something with a very low load capacitance, this could drop down as low as two nanoseconds. And this is a value I've seen on some of the more advanced ASICs that are out there. So in these cases, we actually do encounter situations where we do need to apply series termination on the outputs from these interfaces. So let's take a look at the case where we might need to put a series termination resistor or a parallel termination resistor on, for example, a GPIO or a SPI interface. So we have our driver here. Our driver is gonna output a digital signal. We're then gonna output that to a trace. The trace has some impedance. We don't really care about it for the moment, but we'll get back to that in just a second. And then essentially we get over to some integrated circuit and then that integrated circuit has some load capacitance, which we'll call C sub L. And then this is terminated back to ground. When do we need to actually apply some termination resistor here? So when this channel is short enough, the signal as it rises is going to cover a distance that spans the entire length of this trace over to the load capacitance. So we're basically charging up an RC circuit. And that RC circuit is made up of this resistive impedance plus this load capacitance. And so this is where we get the typical RC type of behavior on a short to moderately sized transmission line. Now this driver also has an output impedance, Z sub out. And this Z sub out value is gonna be on the order of you know, 20 to 30 ohms. And it really depends on the drive strength of this driver. But you can figure out what that output impedance is just from looking at the voltage and the current that are being output from that driver. Now, in the case where this bus is very short, meaning this section of trace here is very short, we would essentially have this driver attempting to charge up an RC circuit where the R and the C are just the resistive output impedance of this driver and then the load capacitance at our receiver. And that's what's gonna determine the rise time of the signal as it's seen at the receiver. Now eventually, as we make that trace longer and longer, eventually the input impedance, Z sub in, looking into this trace, is going to look very different from Z sub out. So we have a situation eventually where Z sub out no longer equal to Z sub in, and then we're already gonna have a situation where Z sub zero, the impedance of our trace, is going to be different from the load capacitance impedance, defined here on the right side of this equation. So because of this, you'll get reflections along this interconnect. And that's now the case where we would want to impedance match here at the input with a series resistor. So if instead of just having Z sub out being 20 to 30 ohms, we replace this with Z sub out plus some series resistor, we can set this equal to the trace impedance. So all you have to do is pick an appropriately sized series resistor to compensate for the low impedance output from this driver. So that's why typically I would say you wanna have something like you know, 22 or 33 ohms for Z sub S. And that's gonna make the sum of these two ranging from let's say 40 to 60 ohms. That's typically gonna be a good enough match to a 50 ohm line that you have here connecting your driver and your receiver. What this series resistor is also going to do is it's going to slow down the edge rate from this driver. So instead of being very fast, it's gonna slow down. And that actually puts you back into a situation where you now have the input impedance having much lower deviation from the output impedance of the driver.
So with an RF circuit, the situation can be quite different. And it really depends on the frequency range you're dealing with. Now, typically what we're doing in, with an RF circuit is we're dealing with components that target Z0 equals 50 ohms. And you can read about why 50 ohms is such an important impedance value in one of the blogs that's linked in the description. Now, this output impedance is usually targeting a 50 ohm trace as well as a 50 ohm load. However, if you look at some component data sheets, the output impedance of this driver is not necessarily going to be 50 ohms. In fact, if you look in some data sheets, the output impedance is not 50 ohms. It's something a bit lower, maybe 30 ohms, and then we have some reactive component that's added to that. So we actually have a complex impedance for our output. And so what you then are attempting to do is to match a complex impedance to what might be a 50 ohm load, or maybe you have an antenna, it's in a 75 ohm load, or it's some other load impedance. In this case, we generally wouldn't use series resistors. What we would actually use is we would use a reactive impedance matching network, which means we would we'd be wanting to use an LC network. So in this case, your termination circuit might look something like this. You have a driver, and then that comes into, let's say, a capacitor that goes to ground, and then we have an inductor, and then we might have another capacitor, and that goes to ground, and then we have to consider the inductance and the capacitance of the pads and the traces in between all of these components, and it can actually get very complex when you're trying to design one of these circuits from discrete components. And sometimes what you have to do is manually tune those component values in order to get the best impedance matching. Now this is the kind of thing that you're going to observe typically up to Wi-Fi frequencies. So up to about say five or six gigahertz. But once you get beyond this frequency range, what you're actually going to see is everything goes back to on-die termination. And so you will start to see in component data sheets, both for driver end components and receiver end components, that the termination is applied to 50 ohms on die. And that 50 ohms is rated to be accurate with in the frequency band in which that component is intended to operate. So as you get to higher and higher frequencies, you actually don't need or want to apply this type of termination circuit or the series and parallel resistor terminations as well. In those cases, you actually wanna make sure that the components you're using have on-die termination, and that's generally the case for modern components. Thanks for the great question. This is an important topic in high-speed PCB design, and it's one that I get asked again and again. Thanks everybody for watching this video. Make sure to hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, leave your comments and questions in the comments section, because if you leave a great comment like this, I might just turn it into a video. Last but not least, don't forget to call your fabricator, folks.